Andrew, I saw you on TV. Oh, you did? Yeah, you looked good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We're Was pushing that... our freedom ticket uh, proposal. Yep. On ABC. <laughs> Oops. And it was a nice warm day in the Bronx. So it was very nice to do that outdoors. <laughs> it helps when it's warm. I mean, mid-December mid could have been really frigid, but it wasn't. Great today. Really great, yeah. Hope we don't get any tornadoes. Thank goodness. Some exciting things happening at the MTA uh, tomorrow. So uh, looking forward to hearing all about those, some of which I know already, but. <sighs> Let's see how we're doing for a quorum. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. I'm just gonna jump in here. This is Max. Um, hi, Max. Uh, hi, uh, Andrew and Howard. I just wanna make sure you guys receive the note that you're uh, now co-hosts. And I also, um, how I did it at CBA is we would also sometimes make a few other uh, members of the board that are here co-hosts too, just in case. Um, so I did send one to Barbara because she was here. Um, so I just wanna make sure that, that you guys definitely got it. Um, yeah, I can see that I got it because I can I can do things that I couldn't do if I weren't a co-host. Yeah, Excellent. I can see that too. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Fantastic. Yep. Thank you, Max. As long as you're not voting, you can start. Yeah. Um, this is the December meeting of Manhattan Community Board 7's Transportation Committee. And uh, I see um, Mr. Zuber's on the call. Um, will we be the having- photo showed it wasn't. It was somebody, uh, another yes. police officer. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, hello everyone. I'm, I'm Captain Mariam, the EXO. Oh. Captain Zuber is out on oh, patrol. Okay. A bunch of uh, emergent issues that he has to deal with. So I usually handle most of the accidents in the in the two O. That is my uh, part of my assignment as the executive officer, and I should be able to answer most of your questions regarding uh, accidents and uh, the issues that we've had uh, year to date. So welcome. That's why great. Don't we, uh, why don't we start with that? Um, um, Howard, we mm -hmm. need to start with asking if somebody would take the minutes. I always forget that. Uh, I know it's not, it's not one of the most fun things to do, but uh, let's see who we have. Uh, I just did it. But yes, you did. If you want to try what we're doing in uh, parks and environment, going in alphabetical order, your turn, you take them. <laughs> it works. Uh, Sarah did it recently as well. Um, uh, let's see, who do we have? Uh, I could do them. I think you did them sort of recently too, Ken. Um, oh. It's an easy one, I think. So if you don't mind, although sure. it's not fair to have to keep having the same people do it when we have 10 or more members. Uh, well, if you got somebody else, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at who's joined us thus far. Uh, and Roberta did it recently too, so. And Elizabeth. I'm no longer officially a member. Oh, you're not? Really? No, so I don't count the quorum. Oh, you don't? Okay. When did you not be? Oh, okay. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, it's recent. Well, I, we have, we have, I, uh, thanks. And if you no, get stuck, you can always take minutes. Uh, well, if you could start, uh, Ken, that would be wonderful. And uh, let's move because we have a number of items tonight. Um, so let's hear from the, from the, from the uh, 20th precinct, uh, we always start with safety. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's do that. All right, so uh, I'm Captain Myrie. I'm the executive officer of the 2-0 precinct. And uh, thank you for your for the opportunity tonight to talk about some of our issues uh, year to date. 
again, uh, we're, we're, we're at the, we're December 14th. So we have an opportunity to look backwards to see our, uh, our safety issues as they presented themselves this year, rather than uh, look at our situation now, we can look back and see how the year, how we have done for the year. But first, let me give a brief overview of our accident picture in the 28 days. That's the period of time that we, uh, we uh, measure accidents. So let's, uh, let's start with that. So for the most recent 28 day period, overall accidents in the tool precinct saw a decrease of three as compared to the same period last year, 39 versus 42. Now these accidents are primarily, primarily due to accidents occurring on the corridors within the precinct. And we've had a, a, a spike of a cab collisions in the period 12 versus three. But again, I would always start with an overview of the tool precinct uh, in general. We don't have a lot of significant infrastructure in the command. I'm talking about bridges or crossings of the like. So most of our accidents occur in the corridors. We're not the 19th would generate a lot of accidents at say the 59th Street Bridge or, or other commands. So all of our accidents occur within that box, which is basically how the, uh, the precinct is designed from uh, you know, the uh, West Side Highway over there from uh, Howard uh, to uh, Central Park West. So you're looking at those sub streets in between Broadway, Amsterdam, uh, Columbus. Those are where most of our accidents occur. So for the 30, for, so for the 28 day period, we're down three accidents, 39 versus 42. Now, the primary accident type in the 2 precinct are side swipes, right? This is mostly due to the narrowing of the roadway south and north, whether by double park vehicles, picking up or dropping off, or due to the temporary dining facilities that we see along Broadway Amsterdam and Columbus. So it's like a, an artery in the human body. Once the, the traffic flow is restricted, everything just shoves together and there's a lot of accidents, mostly the type like this, going in the same direction, but uh, side swipes. Followed by rear enders. That's due to the slowing of the accidents. People are on their cell phones, they're not paying attention and they run into the guy ahead of them. So that's basically where we are with our accidents. Of the 39 accidents in the period, 23 of those were side swipes. So 23 or 39, that's, I don't know what percentage that is, but it's huge. And uh, four rear enders. So the, so the majority of our accidents are occurring on the corridors, like we said. But again, giving us the opportunity to look backwards, we see that the biggest emergent issue that we've had for the 2 precinct this year were our fatalities. Now, we by far you know, outstrip the number of fatalities in Manhattan North. Of the 12 commands in Manhattan North, we had the most fatalities. Now, our fatalities year to date were seven, five of which were pedestrians, one bicyclist, and one motorcyclist. With four of our pedestrian involved fatalities occurring on the Amsterdam Avenue cor corridor. Now, that's between 64th Street and 78th Street, including the most recent of which occurring on 9 11. The common denominator of all of these accidents, by far, four of the seven was age, believe it or not. 65 to 90 years old are victims. So I'm not gonna blame it on the, uh, the elderly, but a lot of these accidents were slow speed accidents that may have been survivable by other parties much younger, maybe, but it is what it was. So 65 versus to 90 years old was the range. And not coincidentally, that's where we've done most of our enforcement activity along the Amsterdam Avenue corridor. Can I, yeah. I'm sorry, can I just ahead, ask you, when you, when you said, uh, when you gave that age range, was that the victim of the, uh, of the collision yes. or was that the, the perpetrator of the victim? Of, no, the, of the, 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 the fatalities themselves, sir. The fatalities, okay, thank yes. you. Yes. So uh, a lot of the, those accidents never occurred on corridors during, they occurred because persons emerged from between parked vehicles. So a lot of them were mid block. You know, again, it wasn't anything out of the ordinary, no high speed stuff, just persons going about their business, you know, on this, getting off the curb at, in the middle of, this, middle of the block and things happen. So that's where we, uh, where we are for the year. And again, much of our enforcement activities occurred along the Amsterdam corridor. And we haven't seen another fatality since 9-11. So we're doing well with what we have, you know, but notwithstanding, you know, we're focusing on the seniors, we're going into the uh, senior centers, but again, only one of those fatalities actually lived in a senior center. Mo much of these persons are, most of these persons are living in the buildings, surrounding buildings with caretakers and family members and so forth. So we've been trying 
Again, I've met with uh, Dale Brown from the Upper West Side Coalition and Chris Giordano. We've handed out flyers to them. We've handed out flyers to the security guards and the, the, uh, the building uh, people. But again, we're, we're, we're trying to find any, any other uh, persons that could assist us in getting that message out because it's not senior centers. And we, we gotta make sure that our seniors are protected and their caretakers and the uh, family members are advised as to how best to do that. So that's where we, uh, looking back, that's, that's the problem that we've seen this year. So let me, let me ask you this and then we'll ask, we'll ask for other questions. Go ahead. Because of, because of the report you just gave and because yeah. you specifically mentioned the narrowing of the avenues uh, between delivery vehicles, outdoor dining uh, structures and what have you, are you, is, is, is the NYPD prepared to make recommendations on first from safety point of view to the Department of Transportation? Well, we understand this year that they're going to continue with the uh, temporary dining facility. So that's something that's not going to go away anytime soon. We've done our best with the enforcement activity. And uh, a lot of persons have, uh, have uh, mentioned the uh, delivery persons that have emerged as a cottage industry after 9-11. A lot of the restaurants that we uh, haven't decreased their use of delivery persons now that the COVID scare is kind of, uh, you know, gone away. So we, we've seen the same number of uh, bicyclists out there. I understand they have their own uh, advocacy group. I forget the name of it, but uh, there's, a, there's a, you know, we have to be careful about how we stop these people that persons are monitoring, whether we're doing it by race or by, you know, activity. So there's a, there's a whole new uh, spectrum of, uh, of, uh, of uh, recommendations to try to hem us in as far and how we can, uh, we can stop these uh, bicyclists. Have you have you noticed um, as a, as a cause of these collisions uh, or accidents, as you put it, have you noticed um, double parked vehicles making deliveries who are not utilizing loading zones or who don't have sufficient loading zones? Is it like FedEx, UPS, mail trucks, and or other delivery or work vehicles that are doing some of this narrowing of the avenues? Right, or just regular persons uh, picking up and dropping off in a um, yeah. in a tight in a tight corridor. So again, not specifically, we're not going to say uh, delivery trucks, but they'll make up make up most of the uh, the problems that we're causing. We're talking about here. Have you right. contacted the uh, DOT to let them know the need for loading zones so that there's not this chaos in the street? Because mm -hmm. we were told uh, we asked over three years ago for loading zones, and in particular in Pew Carters, uh, the Carter where I live has currently zero. Um, and so there's, you know, they've been looking into this for over three years now. And I was just was wondering if, if maybe some more pressure will put on them, they might um, speed it up. Well, obviously that's a, that's, a, that's a concern that I can't, I would be happy to help and assist in, mm -hmm. the, in the requesting of those loading zones, but the police department doesn't uh, have the power to determine, you know, where these right. loading zones- Is, is Colleen from the DOT on, on the call? I guess uh, we don't have our DOT representative. The other thing I, I want to ask- I don't see her is, on yet. Okay, um, when you- Attendees, she needs to be promoted. Oh, okay, can you do that, That's Andrew? easy. Yep, I'll do that. Is Colleen, Colleen here? I'm gonna promote her right now. And she's promoted. Colleen, could you address this? We, we um, requested over three years ago to have loading zones, and I know you're looking into it, and I've already made the point that scientists have been looking into for years what the optimal number of hours of sleep are, and we could all admit it's not zero. So right now we have zero on Hey, most hey Howard, it's Colleen. Um, I did. Hey, Howard, yeah. it's Colleen. Um, we are looking into the loading zones in Central Park West. Um, that is something I sent an email, I think about a month ago. Our team is looking at that, and we'll get back to the community board within the next few months. I mean, okay, I want to say just early make the point, spring Colleen, or so. That we requested this over three years ago. This is a life or death matter. Um, the, you know, the community board are volunteers and we get, we get together and we, we, we express this need on behalf of the community. And it's, again, it's been over three years. Can you please explain why it takes so long? Because we have other community boards that we're working on with as well. And in my email to you, I had sent a link where mm -hmm. I um, had recommended for the community board to take a look at it to identify locations as well. We identified locations over three years ago. 
and we I, under uh, I understand Howard I understand okay. Howard and we are looking into it again and okay. um I will we will get back to you this is approximately 38 meetings you've told me you're looking into it so I, I would just well you know what Howard as much it, as possible. yeah I mean if you'd like you can call Borough Commissioner Pinkard tomorrow and ask him if they can expedite it okay well, I would it, I would it, urge you light to of, that. of what the what what our police uh, just told us, uh, and certainly the commercial strips, Broadway, Columbus, and Amsterdam, um, due to the narrowing, due due to uh, outdoor dining structures and everything, not to mention commercial trucks making deliveries. I think that's that's getting urgent. I mean, yeah. that's we're going to lose more lives if we don't at least act on those. And I understand Howard's request was uh, for a residential street, Central Park West, but now we've heard this actually does mean loss of life potentially. Yeah. It's just very, Colleen, I'm just trying to express, it's very demoralizing to the community board when there's something we've identified years ago that's urgent and is a great safety concern to have it consistently ignored. So maybe if we could go back to Ed and, and explain that, that our frustration, um, we'd be happy to meet with him or you on this matter. But it, again, it's been approximately 36 meetings since we adopted this. We, we need to, to try to do what we can to. I think uh, Colleen got the point. Um, yeah, I think she got the message. We will. Uh, I, I, we will I, I definitely got the message, Howard. I mean, and again, um, if you feel that this is something that you need to take up with DOT, I recommend that you call the borough commissioner tomorrow okay. and have a conversation with him about it. Okay. Yeah, and maybe maybe we'll meet we'll meet a borough commissioner, Pincar, uh, on premises and we'll show him how many vehicles are double parking where they shouldn't be narrowing the street and potentially causing loss of life. So we'll follow up, Colleen, thank you. Can Any other questions, questions for, our, for our police representative? Uh, uh, yes, I have a question. I have a have question. A, I've had oh, my yes, hand up please. since. Um, let me just take uh, committee members. I'm sorry, I didn't see whose hand was up. Um, I see Ken's and I see uh, Sarah's and Jay's. And Rich's. And we'll... Oh, right, he's not a committee member. Yeah. yeah. So, Ken, please go, go next. Okay, um, Captain Myrie. Yes. Um, I wanted to um, ask about the uh, um, seven deaths. Uh, um, and uh, you said most of them are in the 65 to 90 age group. Um, and uh, yeah, it, maybe it's true that uh, younger people might have uh, survived, and but as somebody who's in that age group, um, uh, uh, I take this rather personally. Um, you know, it's not like we're going to stop walking the streets. Oh, no, uh, sir. And uh, so I'm so I'm very concerned about. You say you you've been flyering in buildings. Uh, you're trying to get a message out to them. What exactly is the message that you're trying to get to them? And why do I never hear about flyering uh, or trying to get a message to drivers about uh, driving more safely and carefully. Well, let me, let me, uh, I noticed that there's an ongoing issue between uh, the members here and the invitees regarding the uh, narrowing of the roadway specifically, generally. But let me just talk about the four fatalities along the, uh, the uh, Amsterdam corridor. And they, they did not involve any issues with the roadway or any such incidents that we've been talking about before. So in just, uh, just a snapshot, one of our incidents involved the driver reversing into a parked position, pedestrian walks in behind the car and is struck. Another issue, the driver is making a left turn from 74th Street, strikes a pedestrian in the sidewalk. That, that driver was arrested for a failure to yield to a pedestrian. The other was a, a, an issue, that a, a case that uh, involved uh, an, an actress from California of some, some renown where a scooter went through the red light and strikes the pedestrian and he was arrested uh, later on. And uh, another involving a pedestrian crossing mid block between parked vehicles uh, on, in the bike lane, he's hit the, but with, the, uh, with a scooter. So none of the issues here involved uh, the motorists, you know, doing something egregious. This is just persons going through their regular day activities. I would, in, I would suggest uh, strongly that persons uh, try to use the crosswalks, not go between parked vehicles, not going into uh, trying to cross mid-block and so forth. So if there's anything that, that, that would have 
uh, help the situation in, in these fatalities would have been perhaps the uh, pedestrian uh, pick, making a, uh, an, an attempt to try to try to use the roadways specifically with the lights and the crosswalks and so forth. It sounds like from what you described, at least two of the incidents um, were uh, dr uh, the drivers were totally at fault, the, but backing into somebody um, and also failure to yield. That's not egregious. That person was arrested, sir. The, and, and the, the person the, was the killed. The victim was 90 years old. Yes, it was yeah. eight o'clock at night. Yeah. Again, I'm not. So, so, so what I'm saying is there are two out of the four here. Um, why do we never hear about outreach to drivers? Uh, and it's always. We've done that. We've done that. You yeah. probably noticed the checkpoints that we've had. We've had a significant amount of checkpoints this, uh, this period and going back for the last several months along the Amsterdam corridor. We've given out tremendous numbers of flyers. As well, we've recruited the uh, the Upper West Side Coalition to assist us in that effort. Again, Dale Brown, she knows uh, a lot more persons in this community than I do, and she knows where they live, and she's volunteered to assist us in the effort to distribute uh, materials. Again, I'm not saying that these persons were at fault. I'm just saying that they're persons of significant age. Maybe they're out beyond the time that they, they possibly should. I don't know. I don't know what well, possibly is. what <laughs> they're they're allowed to be. <laughs> Sure they are, sure they are. But then again, <laughs> someone should know where they are and if they need assistance, if they need assistance. It, it sounds like the victims are being blamed here. I, I'm sorry to say I, that. I, well, that's not, that's not, that's not my- Captain, answer. when you mentioned flyering, did you fly your parked cars as well? Yes, we, we've done a, a range of flyers out there. I, again, we've given uh, Mrs. Brown a significant amount of uh, flyers to sift through, to, to see what works in the, near, in the areas that we're talking about. But we've done our efforts uh, along the corridors generally. We want to get to the people to make sure that they don't become uh, continuously uh, become victims of this, this issue. Andrew, Andrew, I'll bring it up at the next at the January Senior Task Force, and we can we can flyer and get out to um, a whole bunch of seniors all across the Upper West Side. My, yeah, my, thank my you, Roberta. My mother is eighty-three years old, sir. My mother's eighty-three. I'm, I we, you know, listen. I'm not blaming anybody. I want people to be safe. In their person no I, I, it's really them. important to get the message out don't don't cross the street between cars and use the crosswalks and wait for the greens and all of that of course but drivers have to also be similarly informed let's move on to other questions sarah thank you um i was wondering i know we just moved away from this a bit but going back to the loading zones issue um you know i think one of the issues is that even if we put more in we often end up with people parking in them that don't belong in them, people with placards or people just parking in them and no, there's no enforcement. So is there, you know, can you speak a little bit about what you can do to enforce loading zones so that we don't have this double parking and the narrowing of the roadways? We don't, don't want to, to... Oh yeah, like how NYPD can help enforce, you know, the rules that are well, yeah, set. You know, Give us a loading zone, and we'll uh, we'll definitely make sure no one uh, no one parks in it. Yeah, I just hear from um, you know commercial operations that would use the loading zones that that's not true. That when they go to try and use the loading zones, they're they're not available. People are parked in them illegally. I, I don't know. Right, which compounds the issue. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jay. You have a question. If you're speaking, please unmute. Uh, it's more of a comment than a question. So okay. if you want to wait on comments, I'll wait. Uh, no, if, you're next, Jay. Go ahead. Well, I, you know, I listen to these discussions uh, and particularly about uh, loading zones. And, and I, I'm, I, I have to say I'm flabbergasted. Um, I don't. I own a car, but I almost never drive intra-city. Uh, but I, I, I had occasion twice in the last several weeks to drive north uh, on Amsterdam Avenue, just coming from the Lincoln Tunnel, where I visit family in New Jersey. Normally, I take the bridge, but there were traffic problems. Uh, which is a whole other ball game on the bridge. And I drove north on Amsterdam Avenue. Amsterdam Avenue is a disaster. 
and a couple of loading zones isn't going to make one whit of difference. I drove up, it was around the dinner hour. So you've got a bike lane, you've got restaurants, you've got buses, you've got deliveries, taxis, picking up people, discharging people. It's, it's insane. There just isn't enough room. If you want one simple solution, the first thing you should do is get rid of the restaurants. And at least you'd have one lane of more room. I understand that's a whole other issue and there's gonna be a discussion of it uh, tomorrow at Land Use. But Amsterdam Avenue is, is just a permanent disaster. Basically, it's a tough when, one. You're, when you're driving on it, you're lucky if there's one open lane where cars can go. So it doesn't surprise me at all that most of the accidents are side swipes because people are constantly trying to avoid obstacles. So Thank you, Jay. I, I think we need to do a lot more than focus on the necessity for a couple of loading zones, which can't even be put in on one side of the avenue because of the bike lane and the restaurants and the parking. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nelson, uh, Nelson Jones, are you still on? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, good. So I'm not sure if the captain um, is familiar. I don't think he covers the 2-0 precinct. Well, I raised an issue with the Community Board 7, um, which the chair knows about. Uh, we wanted to get a school crossing guard on 63rd Street and CPW, oh. which is Central Park West. Oh. So, correct. So, uh, I do know that Captain Neil Zuber uh, did a 49. Uh, I guess uh, the captain here, I didn't get his name. I apologize for that. But uh, I did have I 35 years yeah. with the, thank you. I did have, I do have 35 years with the NYPD prior experience. So, I'm a familiar with the, uh, with the unfortunate bureaucracy sometimes, but mm. uh, I do know there's a 49 that was submitted by Captain Neil Zuber, but I was hoping to hear uh, any information from that 49. Are we gonna get a uh, school crossing guard for ECFS uh, or we're not? That I'd like to know. Okay, sir. So I am the XO of the 2 So we'll speak to you in, in police language. I'm the XO here. I was familiar with your request. Now, I noted that uh, your school is a private school. And uh, according to my, uh, my um, higher ups, you know, our school crossing guards are really uh, specifically attached to the, uh, to the uh, city schools. And there are specific uh, locations that they're checking within the command before we outsource to a private school location, another location. Now, I have advocated for uh, a school crossing guard in, in you know, in, in your case, for your case, and I was, the one, I was the one who sent those officers to you to discuss, whether it was uh, Officer Hanau, I believe it was, who spoke to you before. Correct. The 49 was written. Obviously, the clearance for that uh, that request has to come above us first. So that has made a circulation, and something was sent to the Chief of Patrol, and we've got some uh, response from her regarding the condition. Now, I have suggested that we still use, whether or not we can authorize a school crossing guard, we still try to man the uh, the uh, the location with a, uh, a directed patrol of some sort using our own precinct resources beyond the crossing guard. But a lot of but some suggestions that I've heard as far as recruiting a crossing guard, filling available spots uh, for the public schools first before going into another location. That's the most recent uh, uh, situation um, information that I've heard on that that specific uh, information about your your cause. They want us to fill the open spots that we have for school crossing guards within the command first before we go and fill a, sp a spot that's a private school location. Now, again, my, my people have been out there. They've noticed that you've hired uh, some private persons, someone, some, some persons in uniform to try to help your situation. Is that true? Well, that, that's my staff trying to help out. All right. All right. So again, I'm not going to ignore a situation that exists within the command if it's a public safety situation or not. But again, for you to specifically request a school crossing guard, you know, there's a process that we have to go through to do that. Again, okay, no, no, and I understand that. I understand about processing when it comes to New York City. Now, the question is, 
who is going to make the final determination? It has to be a human being somewhere. Who is that mm -hmm. going to be? Well, that, that request has been sent up to the, uh, to the chief of patrol's office through uh, an inspector Fedorov. Again, he, we're waiting for, uh, for, for clearance from that office to see if we can borrow one, maybe one of our other crossing guards from another location to move to your site. But we can't do that without proper authorization. Again, okay. if, the so, if the condition warrants, I'd have somebody out there at between the hours of three o'clock or whatever. We don't want our kids getting struck. That's the point. And if that's your issue, I'm going to make sure that we have somebody out there to make sure that does not happen. And I Thanks. appreciate that. So, so I'm very proactive. I always was proactive in my career. So uh, what, I'm, what I'd like to know well, is I'm, that I've the community- I also have three, 30, 32 years of experience right now. Well, congratulations. Please don't quit. So the other thing is, like I did. So the other thing is uh, I want uh, the community board to be able to uh, draft a letter to get it to the right person, because that's how it works in the NYPD uh, at the higher level. Now I know that. So the outside of community board, like community board seven, can almost say, you know what, we really need this before a child gets killed or someone gets killed. And then we get police. I don't believe in reactive. I believe in proactive. And that's why- Nelson, Nelson uh, what's, what school are we, are we referring to? Uh, Ethical culture. Ethical culture. That, that, that item is coming up later in this, in this agenda. Just so okay. you know. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Rich, you're the last question and then we have to move on. Great, thank you very much. And thank you so much, Captain, for joining us. Um, as you know, we've had nine fatalities in our district, uh, most of them in the 2-0, up from two last year. And obviously the police have to be a critical part of the solution. So really appreciate your being here. Uh, a few quick comments and, suggest and questions. One is, you mentioned the uh, common trait of victims, and of course the elderly and also children are our highest priority. Wonder if there are any common traits of the drivers, and especially are they local or out of state? Because um, knowing that could be really helpful in knowing just how to reach those drivers that might be causing issues. Another question is, um, you meant, we're talking about fatalities, but I'm wondering if um, there's any tracking of serious injuries, and if those might provide insight into um, where there are dangers either um, locations or traits that might help avoid both um, fatalities and serious injuries. Um, what you said before about uh, the double parking is I think the first time we've ever heard the police talk about double parking as a real factor in fatalities and in crashes. And I'm wondering what stepped up enforcement might be possible. I, I live uh, in the 2-4, not the 2-0. But as one example, Fresh Direct has a permanent parking spot in a travel lane on Amsterdam at 103rd Street, and they just always have a truck there. And, and I'm wondering if it might make sense to try to push these vehicles onto the side streets just to keep the main arteries clear, or what there might be, what might be possible, given that, you know, as you mentioned, double parking could be a major cause of uh, the injuries and fatalities we're experiencing. Um, two other quick things. One. Um, just general stepped up enforcement. I know we want more automated enforcement, but until then uh, we've heard from a number of uh, people in the NYPD that there are very few officers trained to use radar. And I'm wondering what we can do to crack down on speeding. I know that uh, maybe six months ago, there were no speeding tickets given out for an entire month in the 2-0. And I'm wondering you know, how we can get many more speeding tickets. And then the last thing is outside of your terrain, but uh, the highway, We've had two fatalities this year on the highway. And when I've driven on it, drivers are crazy. You see people commonly driving 80, 90 miles per hour. And I almost never see any enforcement on the highway. And again, I know that's not your turf, but I worry that it just sets a tone. As people are driving on the highway going 80, 90 miles per hour, right away they come onto our streets and they see it as a speedway. And are you in touch with the, um, is it the transportation division of NYPD? Because uh, it is part of our district, and I'm wondering what more can be done to crack down on the highway. Well, we do share corridors with the 2-4. You know, your problems are our problems. Again, you know, why we have more fatalities than you do, and you've had a few in the 2-4, for sure. I know that for a fact. Again, uh, you know, we have the same uh, common problems. But the one thing you say, and I want to correct your issue here, our issue is not speeds. Our issue is congestion. It means side swipes, slow speed stuff. We just had a, a, a gentleman comment on uh, the issues along Amsterdam, slow speed, 
you know, with, with people jockeying for position. That's the issue, not, not high speed anything. The persons who were injured and, uh, and unfortunately deceased in the, uh, in the accidents that we've had were involved in low speed collisions. Again, driver reversing to an, into a parking spot, a situation where guys making a left turn 15 mile, 10 miles an hour into a, into a crosswalk, a guy breaking the red light, using a, a scooter, later arrested, and a pedestrian crossing mid-block. So we're not talking about highway speeds here. We're talking about people going about their business and, and getting involved in, a, in, in unfortunate incidents. So again, our enforcement is, is there as far as where we're talking about. We've given out hundreds and hundreds of uh, summons along the, the Amsterdam corridor, along the Columbus corridor, and so forth. We're just trying to make inroads that I spoke to about before, inroads into the community around, surrounds, so that my presence here today would, would serve as, a, as, a, as an opportunity to uh, educate the persons at large. We've used the, uh, again, the uh, Upper West Side Coalition to try to help us do that, not asking them to do our jobs for us, but we believe, I believe, that the residents know where the problems are, and who's here and how to get to them. So again, we've done our enforcement, right? A lot of it has to now do with community education, the outreach to the uh, to restaurants and, and all those individuals in the spectrum of, uh, of persons involved in this effort. And again, uh, that's where we are. So you, 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 you've had a whole raft of, uh, of, of, of bullet points that, I mean, I, I hope I, I address some of them, but uh, high speed is not one of them. Thank you, Captain. This is really helpful. Just one last question. Um, the accidents that you've reported, um, particularly on Amsterdam Avenue, were they daytime or nighttime? With the exception of one, they're all daytime. Huh. Latest at, uh, at eight o'clock at night. Again, early in the morning, right after the celebrations for 9-11 at the firehouse over on, uh, on I believe it's 66, you know, right there. And uh, there was a ceremony, active ceremony going on and then down the block, mid block, this thing happened. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank uh, you. And, and answering our questions. We really appreciate you and everybody at the 2-0 and 2-4 and Central Park precincts. Thank you for all you do. Yep. Appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right. Thanks. Okay. Um, item number one is an update on the M96 M106 layover. I'm sure uh, those who are on land use committee remember a couple of months ago there uh, there is major construction coming to the south side of 96 between Broadway and West End Avenue, where the M96 and the M106 lay over before making their eastbound trips. This construction will necessitate the movement of these layovers. And we have with us Jessica. I hope you're still here. I am still here. We also have Buckley Young too. Oh well, Buckley's Buckley is always Buckley's yes, great. Buckley's the best. So he'll he'll uh, he'll be here to correct me if need be. <laughs> All right. Is, Buckley, do you want me to share my screen or would you prefer? Sure, I'll, I can do it. Like, okay. Hey, Buckley. Hi. Um, does, does that work for everyone? That apparently does. Yep. Okay. Go ahead, Jessica. Okay. Just pulling up my notes here. All right. So as you probably know, um, this layover is needed because of the proposed uh, construction at 270 West 96th Street, right here where, uh, where he's got the mouse. So we're actually going to be moving this down to create a split layover. And you can see there's going to be right here in the blue. Um, there's going to be two buses on either side of the street. The reason for that is if you could see here, um, there is a on the West 96th Street Deli, there is a small um, outdoor dining shed. So we were not approved to have it on one side of this street. And on the other side is the church. So they didn't want to take parking away from that church. So that's why it is the, uh, the split, the split layover there. Um, and when you say the split layover, is it the M96 in one place and the M106 in the other place? Or are they just whatever gets there first gets the, the, the one on the south side of the street and the other one takes the north side? It's whichever gets yeah. there first. And whichever gets there first. Okay, so you really won't know. Uh, but it doesn't matter because it's the layover. Right. Right. And so, um, so, yeah, go please, ahead, go on. please go on. 
Uh, and I was also going to say that they will be providing privileges. Um, Buckley, could you could you just kind of because I think you could speak to it a little bit better. It's, they're going to provide loop privileges to 87th Street and to 96th Street. Is that correct? Correct. So okay. when the bus, this, this is officially the last stop and layover when the bus comes westbound. Um, the bus operator will take his break here. He may just get off the bus and make a quick phone call, or he may go to take a personal to a restroom. So if there's someone on the bus who needs to continue to um, 97th Street, at Western Avenue or to uh, 96th Street at Western Ave, they, that person can get on the next bus or stay on that bus to continue, come around. So just let the bus operator know that you need to go to these stops and he'll know what to do. They'll figure out, he will either ask the customer to get on the next bus or he'll ask the person to just hang, out, hang tight. He'll be leaving soon to turn around. Now, if you live in this area and you're trying to get on the bus, you also can sort of get on the bus here, get on the bus here, and, and to get on to make your trip. However, if that bus operator, if these two spots are already occupied and a third bus comes, this third bus will not be able to lay over here. So it will have to come around and lay over here. So there are different scenarios as to what will will need to ask the customer to do in order to, to take their bus trip going eastbound. Um, so there are two spots where, even though the construction is here, we will be able to maintain one sh short stop, uh, one stop here enough for one bus um, to be a, but not enough to be a layover. Now this- Will you be changing the signage there to indicate that that's a stop, but-, yes. but uh, Yes, okay. Yes, we, we have submitted a work order to DOT to change the signage. This construction is anticipated to take up to approximately three years. And oh. so we, um, and the contractor has told us that they'd like to start work sometime after New Year's. Um, so we don't know the exact date yet, but we want to make sure we have the bus stop moves before they can start the work. Um, also like to point out that the, this stop that's here, that's going eastbound, we'll have to shift it further down the block because this is where <sighs> that bus would be laying over and they will pull up to the, that stop to go further, uh, to go eastbound. Um, it's not quite right at the, uh, at, at the, the orange, red, orange structure that's the restaurant shed, but we'll be in this vicinity. DOT will find it, will let us know exactly where they'll place the poles. Um, how many buses can lay over uh, where your arrow is right now? So there's enough room for two on either side of the two buses on either side. Okay, well this bus, I mean, they don't run that frequently that there would often be two unless one is a 96 and one is a 106. Actually, they're very frequent routes. It's one of our most frequent routes. Um, they run every three to four minutes during the a.m. and p.m. rush hours, the 96. Wow. And the M106 runs um, um, every 12 minutes. So together, um, it could be as many as four buses, not all the time, but if there's some sort of delay, or, um, they can catch up to each other and there could be as many as four buses. Yeah. We do experience that time to time at this location, it's really three spots we, we, we want to have for the layover, and of, which is this, this, and this, and one as the bus stop over here. Yeah. Can I ask okay, a um, so this could start in December? No. I mean, uh, at the end of the year or, or January? Uh, in January or March, but January, February is what we've been told. Okay. All right, um, questions. questions for our presenters on this change yeah. in layover due to construction? I have a question, Andrew. Go ahead, Jay. Uh, the diagram uh, shows still shows two bus stops uh, where the current layover is and one uh, on the uh, east of Broadway where the new one is. Are there still gonna be three bus stops? Or at least, will these two be gone? The, the this, this, stop, 
So if this stop is directly affected by the construction, so this will be gone. Okay, what about the end, the, what about the the end of the block? We'll, we'll be able to maintain a loop privileges stop here. A what? We call it a loop privileges stop because depending on where the bus stays over, um, the, the, um, if, if the bus lays over here, the customer can ask for loop privilege to come around to get to the stop. So well, if, the bus if, I, if I'm walking uh, north on West End Avenue and I get to 96th Street, I'll see a bus stop on the corner uh, on the corner where your arrow is, and there's another bus stop on the east side of Broadway, going east. How do I know which bus stop to go to? They will both buses will both stop there. So, so all so buses will stop there. It's each just, bus will stop at both places. Right. But make sure you flag down the, the bus operator because um, it, it could be that they don't they didn't expect to see a bus operator. They will inform the bus operators, but just keep an eye out that they should pick you up. Well, but if unless so, either so what they're happens, gonna stop, either they're gonna stop at both stops. They or will not. I don't think it should be the obligation of the uh, just say to keep an to eye flag out. down flag down buses. The next thing you know, somebody will step into the street and get hit by a bus. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, they Either will they stop, stop there. They, they, they will stop there. And um, this is something that the dispatcher uh, who's, who's stationed here will work out with the bus operators. So, um, so again, if the bus... If, if the westbound bus is coming this way and sees that these two locations are, locations are occupied, they have to come around to lay over at this spot. So, so if, if when they're coming around, they may or may not pick this person up because by the time, if they pick this person up, that bus is gonna lay over here. So they're gonna have to get off anyway. Um, so, uh, but it's a, it's it's a choice, a matter of choice. You could just you could get on that bus and, and then when you get here, you have to sit through the layover. So in terms of operation, it's kind of tricky because um, there may, meanwhile, this bus who's finished its layover, who was occupying this this location, will come around and he will be able to pick this person up and then and then go on along this trip to eastbound. So it's not ideal and it's a little tricky, but given the situation that we have, um, this is what we can do. We have looked at other locations for the layover. Um, again, we could not take the entire North Curve because of the St. Francis Church on this end of the block. Um, we, we looked at this block to put our buses to layover, but this is quite residential. We looked at this block it's not long enough to accommodate the buses that we need. And the buses would have to um, lay over here in order to, to, to maneuver into the lane to make its left turn. It cannot lay over here at the front of the block because it would be too difficult to make the left turn crossing traffic to get to make that turn. So they usually make the turn from the travel lane. If they were parked in the park in the in the curb lane, they, they cannot make this turn from this location. So would it, be, would it be possible instead of putting the onus on commuters to figure this all out at any given moment where they should stand or where they can't stand or where the bus is going to stop or where it's not stop, to have somebody on duty uh, at this location, uh, at least directing people to the next bus that's actually going to take them someplace other than a layover? Um, we, we really don't have the staff for that. However, there is a dispatcher for this vicinity, and he will be mo mainly keeping an eye on the bus operators and to, uh, but he will, I suspect he'll go back and forth from time to time to see what's happening at this stop. I'm sorry, we just don't have the resources for that. Buckley, let me ask you this. Um, it's really important that the bus operator have 
the correct signage on, if they're making the curve and coming on to 96, 96th Street and they're going on their break, it should have not in service on and then they come over to the next block and take their break. If it has, you know, the east side destination on it, people will think it's not, it's ready to go. Correct. And they, they will be instructed to do that. But, you know, bus operators uh, will try to correct the best ability, but there will be times when a bus operator forgets, to, just to be quite honest. And I know they have incorrect that. destinations on some buses even. Right. I correct them all the time. That's yeah, right. And th you that's know, important. You know, you know why this route is actually, even though it's a very busy route, it's quite a short route. And so by time, it, it doesn't take too long to go from one end to the other end. And it's just, um, it's just easy to forget to do that, so. On the westbound buses, um, one of our members, uh, one of the community board members asked, um, can you get off at West End Avenue on the westbound route? Yes, so. Up, up there yeah. is technically okay to get off, yes. huh? Yes, okay. so again, if the bus is terminating here, um, the customer will have to sit on the bus and wait until the bus operator is ready to continue. And we call that loop privileges. Or if the next bus comes around, um, that next bus may or may not be able to take that person around. It depends. So it's a little bit of uh, monitoring uh, when the buses come along. Wow. Yeah, it is very tricky. I'm very sorry about that but we don't really have many options uh, for layover locations. If we were able to have this entire north curb, we could have all the layover here and have all the pickups Of course, here. yes. But, and and, uh, and well, last um, stop and first stop here, but, but we're not able to do that. So this is likely to happen in January or February, you're thinking? We, we were, we were finally contacted by the uh, contractor um, earlier this week, who told us that they hope to begin work in that time frame, but we still don't know. They haven't. Um, we first have to. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we have submitted the paperwork to DOT, and the contractor has to pay DOT for the bus stop moves, and DOT will have to go up there and move do the bus stop changes uh, before they can do any work. And we think that would can take at least through the end of January. Um, I assume you're aware of the pending reconstruction of the 79th Street Rotunda. Yes. And how all traffic will be diverted to the 95th, 96th Street exit of the Henry Hudson Parkway at that point? Yes. Uh, are you planning for that with the additional traffic that's going to be in the 96th Street corridor? Well, um, I'll... I'll um, Road operation staff will keep an eye on that and monitor that they are aware, um, which is another reason why we didn't want to extend the bus further. We, we really can't extend any, fur any further, but we want to avoid going further west. Yes, but yes. All right, any other questions for um, our guests before we move to our next item? Well, Jessica and Buckley, thank you so much. We'll be watching. Thank you. Thank you and have a good evening, everyone. You too. Um, Hannah, I've promoted you to panelists. So um, are you hearing us and are you ready to give us Hi. your presentation? Yes, yes, I am ready. Um, a pleasure to be with you all tonight. So I was asked to come to CV7 to talk about um, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. There's a lot of content here. So what I thought that I would do is do just like some table setting of broadly what the um, bill provides, what it provides to New York, and then talk about some of the programs that might be of interest to the community board that might be like pertinent for um, some of the issues that you long talked about that might be relevant for some funding. So nationally, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act provides $550 billion in new spending over the next five years. So nationally, it's $110 billion in new funds for roads, bridges, and major projects. 32.9 billion in new funds for public transit, 66 billion investment in passenger and freight uh, freight rail, uh, $50 billion for climate resiliency projects and 65 billion for broadband access. So that's nationally. So what does this mean for New York? So New York, and I do apologize. I know the Congressman came to the last full board and uh, cited some of these numbers, but I wanted to make sure um, that we just reiterate them to give us some context. 
Um, so in New York, we'll receive um, 11.6 billion for federal aid highway apportion programs and 1.9 billion for bridge replacement and repairs, 9.8 billion to improve public transportation options across the state, much of which will go directly to the MTA, 100 million to help provide broadband coverage across the state. Um, this will include 20% of people in New York will be eligible for an affordability connectivity benefit, which will help low income families afford internet access. Um, another 3.6 billion to prepare New York infrastructure for the impacts of climate change, cyber attacks and extreme weather events. 2.6 billion over five years to improve water infrastructure across the state. And so that a clean, safe drinking water is a right in all New York communities. $685 million for infrastructure development for airports in New York. Um, and then last thing I wanted to flag was 6 billion for the Northeast Corridor grants, which include um, programs like Gateway um, and the Northeast Corridor Federal State Federal State Partnership set aside. Um, there are 24 billion a lot of there. What's really important about it is that there's it'll impact commuters' ability to get in and out of the city, which is something that obviously, you know, being if, if folks in Manhattan, we think about. Um, so that's a lot of what's going on in New York. So the way that the money is going to be allocated is that the money is given to New York through formula funding to the state, which is pre-existing formulas and then competitive grant programs, which both the city and state governments apply for. So an important thing to note is that, you know, community boards itself won't be able to, to apply for funding. It's going to be obviously partnerships between city and state government, city and state agencies and things like that. So there are hundreds of competitive grant programs enumerated in the bill. So there's technological or technical change, excuse me, to send their old programs to expand um, eligibility and parameters and then brand new programs. Um, so it's really important for the community board to work with all of our city and state partners to um, explain priorities. I know that you did your you know, expense and capital uh, priorities and budgeting. So there are some programs that um, I was able to look through that might be of interest and might be something that you want to you know, sit down with folks. We are happy to facilitate conversations, but I just wanted to make sure to flag that. Um, before I continue, Elizabeth, do you have a question that I'd be happy to um, take? Oh, no, I was just going to wait till you were done. I was, had a quick question. Oh. But keep okay. going. This is great. Okay. Thank you. So each program is going to have its own eligibility requirements, application, and deadline. So I'm not going to have answers for those tonight. You know, the parameters haven't been established. We don't know where the money is exactly going, but it's going to go to the state. So sometimes it goes to the state legislator it's, uh, legislature itself. Sometimes it goes to different agencies. Some of these are, you know, programs that um, the federal uh, government has been funding the state for a long time. Some of them are brand new programs. So um, there are too many to count. So as things come up, you can feel free to email me with specific questions. Happy to come back to the board and present on all these things. I also am going to include in the chat, there's um, DOT gave a great breakdown of how the monies are going to go to New York, which I'll include, but also um, uh, Senator Canwell gave a full breakdown of all the programs listed. So I'm going to, I basically what I did was I kind of flagged a few tonight that might be a relevance to uh, CB7, but I want to provide all the programs to you because if anything is pertinent or um, it really will allow for a lot of um, ingenuity and innovation and, um, you know, different ways of thinking about programming that might be of interest to the board um, in coming up with. So here are some of the programs that I wanted to start the conversation with and then happy to open up and have a larger discussion. So one of the um, programs is that um, the bill, uh, the, uh, the law adds flexibility to the congestion mitigation and air quality improvement program and it, because it allows eligibility to include bike share and shared scooter systems. Um, so there's different um, eligibility there. There's also um, one of the programs adds eligibility for a capital project for the construction of bus rapid transit corridors and dedicated bus lanes in public transit, which is something that we've seen here on the Upper West Side. Um, there is a lot of money allocated for vulnerable road user research, and this might be something, you know, as relevant to our earlier conversation. So this program directs the um, Federal Highway Administrator to establish a research plan to prioritize 
research and roadway designs, the development of safety countermeasures to minimize fatalities and serious injuries to vulnerable road users, and the promotion of bicycling and walking within our streets. Um, this also is something that I know is important to you all that includes research related to roadway safety improvements, the impact of speed, uh, traffic speeds, and tools to evaluate the um, impact of transportation improvements and projected rates and safety of cyclists and walkers, which I know is something that has come up at the board often, which kind of dovetails into the next program I wanted to flag, which is Safe Streets for All. So this funds state and local uh, Vision Zero programs and other improvements to reduce crashes and fatalities, especially for cyclists and pedestrians. I think it's like something like five billion is in the is in the law. Um, the program, um, there also, there's a new program that would um, provide resources to eliminate barriers uh, to access for seniors and persons with um, differently abled persons on transit. So right now, you know, nearly 20% of rail transit stations are not ADA accessible. So this would allow for seniors and uh, persons with disability from util fully utilizing um, the transit systems. Um, there's a lot of money going to what's called the Promoting Resilience Resilient Operations for Transformative, Efficient, and Cost-Saving Transportation, i.e. the PROTECT grant program. This is um, funding for resiliency in our transportation systems. You know, we live right on a, uh, we're right next to an estuary. There's a lot of, um, you know, concern about climate change and making sure that we have uh, resiliency efforts, um, that we have coastal resiliency, that we have funding for evacuation routes, that we make our infrastructure more resilient. So there's a lot of money set aside for that. And um, something that is very relevant to the Upper West Side is there's um, a new grant program to fund projects to eliminate or control existing invasive plants um, or prevent um, introduction or encroachment by new invasive plants along areas adjacent to transportation corridors rights of way, which we have many of. Um, something else to flag is that there's, um, we're gonna improve the state freight plant and multi-state freight corridor planning. So. What it means is, you know, the Upper West Siders understand the importance of the freight corridor planning because we live right next to, you know, the George Washington Bridge. Um, trucks come over or pass through on their way to Long Island to Connecticut, um, and they push traffic onto our road. So this would prevent, uh, this would encourage uh, more thoughtful planning across multiple states to make sure that we're mindful of the way that freight interacts with our traffic patterns locally. Um, I think I'm going to stop right there. There's so the point is, is that there's like a lot of programming available to be thoughtful of a improving infrastructure to improve the relationship between infrastructure and pedestrian safety, cyclist safety, car user safety. Um, so there's a lot of things here. Um, but I would love to hear from you all. You know what your thoughts are, what your questions are, and how you know you and the community board can get your thoughts and ideas shared at the appropriate levels of government and kind of go from there. So happy to open it. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot. Content. Yeah, it's, and I'm happy to send all of this into the committee in an email, but I just wanted to make sure to give like a framework for all of this. Hannah, are, um, are, you, again, considering, are you considering the federal um, infrastructure plan that was passed and what it's going to do for the gateway tunnels part of something that benefits the Upper West Side because that benefits the whole region. Yes, I mean, absolutely. And this is something that Mr. Nadler has been working on for over 20 something years to get this. And we just got the permits to move ahead with gateway. So this is absolutely that funding. Um, I forget where the, it, it's either the 24 billion or the 36 billion, but there's money in there specifically um, that's going to be used for the gateway program as well. Great. And you heard Senator Schumer announced yesterday 500 million is going for the Penn Access part of the Northeast Corridor, which is going to bring Metro North trains down the Amtrak Corridor over the Hellgate Bridge and into Penn Station. Finally. And that's part of that's part of this money as well. Exactly. Correct. Great. Elizabeth, you had a question. Yeah, just a quick thing. Um, thanks, Hannah. This is a great synopsis of everything that I know you've been working on. Uh, I think it would be great if we could, as community board, figure out a way to post this on our website, just because a lot of people are asking exactly what's going on. And I think our office can work with you on making that happen. And then just on the, the freight tunnel issue, which I know, um, I know the Congressman has been so focused on since the time I first met him in the, uh, in the nineties and early two thousands. Um, do you, 
that's part of all of this and it does impact our neighborhood um, given it the far west side. <coughs> Do you, is that something that we can also just stay in touch with you on? It's really something that I think is really critical on the infrastructure needs of our neighborhood. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's multiple things too. So one, obviously I'm at the community board meetings all the time, happy to, you know, answer questions as they come up, but also happy to set up time to sit down. Um, you know, we can set up some time even with Rob Godheim, our um, district director to talk about some of these needs. I mean, I, again, I think that what's going to be really important is to hear from community members like yourself of there's all this money out there, right? There's all these different types of programming out there. So we need to hear immediately, one, how it's going to impact or what 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 community members' thoughts are on a lot of these issues. What are ways that we can make sure that um, these programs are working for community members? And then to hear your thoughts on these larger, you know, multi-decade projects and how uh, they're going to, again, impact the community. Yeah, so happy and people, to people might think that the freight tunnel is like not super relevant, it's not immediate, but it is something that all the things we're Absolutely. talking about right now, about travel and cars going down the streets, having that tunnel has been something he's been fighting for for um, as long as I've known him, over two decades. And that's something that will dramatically impact how this infrastructure gets built. So. Thank you for continuing to um, keep us surprised of all this. That was absolutely. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions. We do. Um, uh, Roberta Ken. and Ken, can I just um, interject something that sort of sure. um, covers all of the issues you've raised? Uh, just anecdotally, the um, the Second Avenue subway costs two point two billion dollars per mile whereas a similar extension of a subway in Paris costs $400 million per mile. By the way, the person who headed the, um, the $400 million per mile subway extension was fired for cross overruns. I was just wondering if there's anything in this bill to prevent the, um, to ensure that this money is spent efficiently, that we're not paying $4 million for a bathroom or $70 million for a set of elevators. So I, I completely hear what you're saying. I, you know, again, because each program is going to be, they're going to have different metrics, they're going to have different eligibility guidelines and parameters. I think like objectively, yes, we would love to have that. I can't answer definitively what the, um, you know, guardrails are for that. But knowing that, um, again, I think this is something that when the different programming um, pieces come out, because again, this is just federal funding of it, um, I don't know what each eligibility looks like. I don't know what each reporting structure looks like, but it's something that we can advocate for, for sure. And, you know, work with our- There's a lot of work government. to be done there. I hear you, Howard. Uh, point well taken. Howard, Sorry, just sorry, because you mentioned Second Avenue and the cost, um, per the number of passengers, it will move. It's actually lower per passenger than many other lines in other cities, just so you know. I'm not saying it's not high. But yeah, that's that's a metric I never never looked at it that way, but you, that's a good point. It will carry more people on the just the new section from 96 to 125th than complete <laughs> systems in other cities. Great. Roberta uh, let's and then see. Ken. Roberta Ken, and then Ken. Was Ken. Yeah. Oh, Ken. Ken and then Roberta. Okay, uh, two questions. One, uh, to follow up on Elizabeth's question about the freight tunnel. Is it actually, could it be funded through this bill or, or is is that something different? No, that from my understanding, the specifically, I think it's the northeast quarter set aside. There's definitely um, I forget which price in um, when when I'll send you the, the documents. It's when it says like the northeast corridor grants, gateway is one of them. I forget which one it is, but I can get um, I can check in with our team and get the uh, exact breakdown of how gateway is going to be, uh, you know, which program it's underneath, if it's a formula funding versus grant. I'm pretty sure it's a formula funding, but let me circle back with all that information on Gateway, but it's definitely included in this bill. We were very mm -hmm. pleased to see it. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm also pleased to see, um, you know, it's a small percentage of the total, but historically it's unprecedented, the, the amount of funding for um, uh, safe streets, Vision Zero, uh, bike share, things like that. Um, how, how do we know what's possible as a community board? How, how do we, like, there's all this money out there and all these programs. How do we make use of it without, like, becoming legislative experts or something? Uh, or do we have right. to become legislative experts? 
So again, I think that the city and state elected officials and the state agencies are going to have that information. So I think it's, um, it might behoove us to like, I mean, again, I'm going to send you the information for all these programs, but I would definitely, you know, come January, sit down with some of the state elected officials when the uh, program parameters are released to talk about what is something that, you know, we might want to encourage people to apply for. Um, you don't have to become a legislative expert quite yet, but there are going to be, um, again, because the state and cities are the only entities that can apply for these programs, I think figuring out um, which programs, you know, again, with the community needs that you've all listed, which programs might be relevant, and then figuring out how to encourage those entities to apply for the funding. So it's a beginning of a conversation is what I would say. Again, we don't have the information yet. Also, when things get released, I'm happy to come back to the board and share, um, but we just, right now it just, we passed the bill and we know that this is what the funding is, uh, you know, the programs allocated uh, or funding allocated for specific programs, but we don't have the breakdown of what it looks like quite yet. So I don't have a definitive answer, but there is um, a lot of conversation ahead is what I would say. Okay. Roberta. Hi, Anna. It, it's such a pleasure to work with you on this. So as chair of the budget and strategy committee, we hope that we will have several meetings with you over in 2022 to start working on some of this. Absolutely. Um, it, it just, it impacts so much of, of what we do as a community board. And um, I, I, we're just thrilled that this was passed. And, um, you know, obviously states, safe streets, accessibility, resilience. I mean, it's, it's all resigned. It's all amazing. So thank Past you. transit improvements. <laughs> exactly. You know, getting from here to there safely. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it's something that we as community board have been concerned about for years. And, and we are thrilled that our congressman has been a prime mover in all of this and that you are, and, and we're thrilled that you work with us on this. We, we love having you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, a piece of legislation. So we're excited to work with you and bring it to our community. Hannah, the freight tunnel that Elizabeth and you were talking about previously, what route is that take? Is that proposed to take? If I'm if I'm understood that Gateway is going to, I was getting confused between crossover and Gateway. Gateway, I'm pretty sure is like it's through downtown, like the like um the Battery Tunnel area, I'm pretty sure no, that Gateway that's where- is, it Gateway is, a, is another Hudson River tunnel from Penn Station to New Jersey. Thank you. Yes. So that's what I was saying. There's two, there's multi, there, there's two uh, tunnels that we have. Again, um, I'm not sure of the, exa the exact things. Let me circle back on that because okay. um, I didn't get to check with our legislative team. They've I mean, Congressman Nadler has long promoted a tunnel from the New York Connecting Railroad, which was a freight only route that goes through Queens right. to Brooklyn to, to Bay Ridge. And then he, he advocated for the tunnel under the harbor and into New Jersey. Right, so that's why we have Cross Harbor and we have Gateway. So I, I just wanna make sure that I gave you the correct information. Um, I didn't wanna mix the routes or anything like that. But yeah, they're both, I mean, they're both really important in making sure that we, get some trucks off the road by getting, you know, getting, making sure that we move freight rail connected to the larger network of, of you know, transit in the quote mainland, right? So, yeah, yeah. but you know, Thanks. you've all known, you've worked on this for a long time. Let me get you all that information. And again, what I'm going to put in the chat is a full breakdown of all the programs that are available. So take some time to peruse it. And then, you know, when January, February, let us set up some time to speak. I'm happy to come back to the committee. I'm happy to have um, additional conversations, just let me know how we can be helpful. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, okay, moving along, we have um, a request from Green Market for the renewal of their loc. Oh, sure, let me let Robert, Robert is trying to come in. Uh, let me get him in. Okay, Robert, you should be in. Um, so Green Market is requesting a renewal of their 97th Street and 77th Street 
Um, locations, is there any discussion on their application? Can they just quickly, Andrew, explain uh, the location, the hours? Uh... I got a call today, Jay, from Kathy Chambers, who would have been on, and she could not come on. Um, she's a, very apologetic, but something came up, and she can't be with us tonight. But Does anybody we should know still consider it. The details? Um, if for some reason people don't feel comfortable, um, we can we can ask her to join before the full board so they don't lose a month. But this is the month we normally approve these things. Andrew? Yeah, Mark. The um, the 77th Street one is on Sunday. Full, Sunday. It starts at 9 o'clock and it goes to 4. The one on, on 97th Street is on Friday. It's, I believe it starts at 8 o'clock and nominally it goes to 4. If you show up at 10 minutes to 4, you're going to have slim pickings. But those are the hours. I, I also heard from Kathy that it's possible, although not definite, but possible that the city would not uh, approve the 77th Street market. Um, but for sure, the, the 97th Street, they probably would. There, there's obviously an issue with the 77th Street market. I don't know if it's construction related or uh, or what, but uh, if, if people would rather hear from Kathy directly, we can we can schedule this before the full board, we can have a quick transportation committee meeting, whatever people feel most comfortable with. It's, normally we approve these every year, but. Andrew, when it's appropriate, I have my hand raised. Uh, let's see. Um, after Ken and Barbara, then it's appropriate. Ken or Barbara, Ken just spoke, so Barbara, you go. Okay, um, I just wanted to say that um, the 97th Street Market is a wonderful market, as is 77th Street. And unless something major is changing, I don't have any problem voting in favor of it now. Okay, thanks. Ken? Um, well, it's very concerning that the 77th Street Market um, is in jeopardy, it, it seems. Uh, that is wildly popular. Um, um, much more so in my uh, experience than the 97th Street. I go to both of them. Um, and I'd like to know why it might be in jeopardy. And if it is, I think we should have a very, I would propose a very strongly worded re resolution that it not be tampered with. Yeah, um, she was not, she didn't have time to explain what the city's problem was. And if people really wanna hear this, we can easily schedule this before the next full board meeting so they don't lose a month. Um, willing to listen to everybody. Um, let's see, we have um, Mark wants to speak and Rich wants to speak. And I think that's what we have. Uh, Robert as well. Um, I just wanted to say that the 77th Street Market has gone through the worst of the interruptions with the Gilder Center construction site and has managed it brilliantly. Um, there's been no real problem with anything. Um, I think our committee, I think your committee did a good job of giving the um, giving the, the construction folks a heads up about where to put or redirect some of the lines. They split the, the market in half, uh, north and south of the construction site. So it's been running like a Swiss watch. I, I, I join with folks thinking that a that, uh, strongly worded resolution should be adopted tonight. Um, I don't think we need, personally speaking, and I'm not a member of your committee, but I wouldn't need any more information to vote robustly in favor of this. All right, thank you for that. Agree. Agreed. Uh, Rich? Yeah. Andrew, I started out asking. Huh? I, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand, Jay. No, no, no I, I'm sorry to raise it. Just, just a quick comment because I started out asking about the details, uh, and it started this discussion about possibly putting it off. But I, I'm willing to accept Mark and uh, Ken's, you know, uh, enthusiasm and uh, experience with it. I, I mean, I know where it is. I just, it would have been helpful to know what the problems are. It's yes, it would. Era, but but I'll take it on faith and I think we should just go ahead. Okay, Robert and then Rich. 
Yeah, Andy, can you explain the uh, alert that we got from Michelle yesterday on uh, a project being commenced at 78th Street in Columbus? Uh, it was TC something. I, I think it was, I forget which agency uh, that it was. And I, I didn't understand that, uh, what the work was. Just curious what, what's happening there. Can we do that I'm in not... new business? Uh, what, Jay? I said, can we do it in new business and just... Yeah, yeah, let me, let me, uh, I'm, let's, let, let's get through this one, Robert, and then, uh, Rich, sure. you were next. Sure. Yeah, so I agree that uh, it seems like there's unanimous support, so a, a vote tonight makes sense. I, I also agree that we should um, have a strongly worded resolution saying that 77th Street is really important. The third thing I want to mention is uh, Union Square went from being, I think, just originally Wednesdays and Saturdays, and now it's open Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. I'm wondering if it makes sense to uh, see if they might be able to expand the days and not just have uh, these two markets open one day a week and if they might be, be able to be open more than one day a week. Um, that could possibly complicate matters, especially for 77th Street where there could be an issue. So um, I think we'd probably be in, in a better stand if we approve them strongly worded and you know, approve them both in a strongly worded fashion um, and and not let on that we know that 77th Street might be in jeopardy because otherwise it looks like we've been we've been told. Um, but whatever whatever the committee would like to do, it's, it's fine. Anybody else have any thoughts on it? All right, so is the resolution to uh, approve Green Market's request for West 77th and West, Se uh, West 97th Street Green Markets for the, for the year of 2022, um, keeping and, and say we, we fully support these markets and think they're an important addition to our community? Something wording like that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Does that work for everyone? Yeah. All right. I yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say addition. I would say by now they're an important part of our community. Important part, they're, yeah. Yeah, they're an integral part of in, our in, community. Yes, integral, yeah. very good. Okay, <laughs> you're taking the notes, uh, the minutes, Ken, so make sure you write that down. All committee members in favor, let's raise your hands. Digital, hopefully first. Let's see what we got. One, two, three. Four, five, six, <clears throat> seven, eight. I see eight committee members, um, and I believe that's all we have here Howard. with us. <clears throat> Howard is nine. And my hands up, I can't raise it. Oh, I'm sorry, you didn't raise your digital. Okay, that's nine, that's great. Uh, we'll lower those. Um, Non-committee board members in favor, please raise your hands. Well, wait, let me lower all the hands first. Okay, now. Non-commit lower hands. Non-committee board. Non-committee board members in favor. I see one, two, three. Nelson, you're not. You're not a member of the community board, right? No, I'm not. Okay, so I can't count you. Uh, one, <laughs> two, three. Uh, three non-committee members in favor, and I think that's all of them. So that's great. Uh, we will we will bring that to the full board, and thank you all. Um, and I will try to get to well, I have MTA tomorrow, but I will try to get in touch with Kathy and see if I can get a, a further story on what the possible problem might be, and if we need to alter our resolution, maybe we can meet again before full board if if that's necessary. Um, right. Okay. Our last item is potential letter of support regarding the request by Ethical Culture School for a school crossing guard. Um, we've heard some something about this earlier tonight. Nelson, did you want to add anything? Um, you heard the police I, captain and, and where he's going with this. He needs to get approval from somebody on, on high, obviously. Uh, can everybody hear me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, the, yeah. What, what, um, Nelson, thank you. excuse me. What? What's your position with the school or what I'm, I'm the deputy, I am I'm the deputy director for public safety in the school. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, sir. 
Um, so I'm new at the school in that position. Um, my prior experience was with the NYPD and the New York City Transit Police for a total of 35 years. Um, so one of the things that I noticed in the school and my predecessor, who was a supervisor as well, when uh, she pointed out the job to me, was that the children uh, face a potential uh, injury because of the wide street there at CPW. Uh, she had sent a letter to Captain Neil Zuber about a year and a half ago, but got no response from him. So of course, when I came in there, I said, well, let me follow up and see where I can go with this. Um, and of course I sent him a letter, I got no response. And then when I sent him a letter, but of course I included community board seven and I sent the letter to about five different chiefs in the NYPD. So I don't, I am familiar with the chain of command at the top. So of course, once I did that, the next day I came into work and my phone was ringing off the hook from the 2L precinct from, uh, we could have done it differently. Why did you go that route? I said, simply put, uh, my predecessor didn't get anything, couldn't get any response from the 2L precinct. I tried the, the, the right way. I got no response. So I figured, let me go at the top of the command staff. Uh, since that, uh, uh, letter went out. I did, uh, the 2L did send several officers to talk to me, um, trying to see what could be done. A 49 was generated, which is a request. Uh, but I'm not satisfied with that because I already know what's going to happen. It's going to get lost somewhere at the Patrol Borough Manhattan or 1PP, a police headquarters. But I do know one thing from my experience growing up in New York City. Uh, I know that it is the outside agencies, whether it's the community board, whether it's the councilman or council person, that has a tremendous in, uh, influence on decision makings, uh, such as this matter in the NYPD. It won't be up to Captain Zuber because he's the commanding right. officer of the precinct. So that I do know. I also did find out, speaking to the officers in the precinct, how many school crossing guards does the 2 have? To my surprise, they only have one or two in the entire area. So I said, well, why can't they just give us one since they don't have, they don't have any slots anyway? So um, I did hear from officers like the other XO mentioned today that this is a private school. And my concern is, you know what? In law enforcement, once these children come out to the street, it becomes the responsibility of the NYPD. They don't walk out into a private park. It is up to the precinct to, to protect the people and the children in that community. Um, and as I mentioned to the XO, I want to try to do something being proactive as opposed to wait for something to happen. And then we're looking at it, uh, some news article that a kid got hit or killed or someone walking the street there, which is a very busy street, by the way. Nelson, let me ask you this. What kind of signage is there on that block alerting motorists and anyone else that there's a school there? And to watch None. for children? None. 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 Well, uh, we the can other do good something question. about that. Um, yes, yes. The other thing, the, and trust me, I'm not, I am true blue NYPD through my veins. But I also, my other question would have been is, and, and I know I'm new uh, here asking everybody, but please, 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 when you get different police captains or different people from the NYP, ask them questions like how many summonses are issued in that particular area for the hey. calendar year? Hey, Nelson, it's Colleen from DOT. How many students attend that school? 450 from pre-K to fifth grade. Okay, um, I'd like to help you in terms of signage and markings. I'm going to put my email address in the chat. Um, if you can uh, call me tomorrow so we can discuss it further, we'll see what we can do. I can Fantastic. have our school, sa school safety come out there and do a survey. Th thank you. One other thing that, that it was of concern for a year and a half ago from my predecessor was that uh, on 63rd Street, when you make that right turn going west, when the light turns green, not only can the car on the right make a right turn, the car heading northbound can make the same left turn at left the same turn. time. Yeah, that's ridiculous. It is. It's a hazard right there. And not only that, but you also have a city buses and our school buses. Yes, you do. The M10. Yeah. Correct. To me, it's an accident waiting to happen. 
we got to have signage at a very minimum. At but the minimum. we also, yeah, at a very minimum and do something about those, those conflicting uh, traffic lights. So I was yeah, we can also that look this... at the signals as well. We can look at the signals. Yeah. I just put uh, my email uh, address in the chat, Nelson. Um, send me an email tomorrow and we'll have a conversation about this, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. I was hoping that committee could, um, now the XO mentioned who, who uh, the decision may fall under, and I forgot his name. I didn't have a pen to write it down. But being you're recording this, he did mention what supervisor in the NYPD would be making a decision. So I would like to know if the community board can, I guess, support it in a letter or somehow to, was, to see how we could push this way. Federer. Federer. What did you say, Ken? Uh, the guys he mentioned, his name was Fedorov. I don't know how you Federer, said it. Yeah, I missed the name. Uh, I'll look it up when I get back to work tomorrow. <clears throat> so, what's the committee's feeling on writing a letter of support? I mean, we also need to uh, write a letter to, uh, to DOT asking them to uh, look at the signals at 63rd and Central Park West and please put signage on 63rd Street. Uh, alerting motorists and, and and anyone else about a school and it's a, you know careful sc school school block school zone whatever whatever the wording normally says. Andrew, I have a, a question. Sure. Um, I I was a little unclear from the earlier exchange, Nelson, between uh, you and, uh, and the twentieth precinct representative. Um, does the city, uh, the city policy to provide uh, crossing guards at private schools? That's a good question. And what I found out is that there are some private schools who do have school crossing guards that are paid by the city. Uh, so it's not unheard of. Okay. Uh, it depends on how much political clout that community has. Yeah. Okay, so, so the... So there are instances of crossing guards at other private schools? Yes. Okay, that's my first question. So then my second question is, is who, what agency? Is it the police department? Is it DOT? Uh, what agency makes, uh, has the authority and makes the final determination? And part of this is if we do uh, write a letter or anything in support, we want to make sure that it, that the channel that we're sending it in is the right one to get to the decision makers. It's NYPD. Uh, yeah, and I, yeah, thank you so much. It is the NYPD. It is. Okay. And Colleen, uh, you agree with that? Colleen? Yeah, I do. Okay. Oh, so it would go to the named person at NYPD. Okay. Yeah. Nelson, it, it also sounded as though the captain was saying, uh, if you have an elected official that can write something uh, from our area, that would be helpful. Do you have- Absolutely. Such yeah. yeah, that would help. I'm not familiar with the elected officials in the um, community board seven, but definitely. Well, it's gonna change. Uh, no, one, one last, one last thing I have. And of course. But, one, yeah. one last thing I'd like to add, and I was talking to a uh, supervisor at the 2O, and mo I live in the 90 precinct in Brooklyn, and they have a police officer assigned specifically to bikes and mopeds who go through the red light almost every day. And I said to myself, why is it the 2O can't have that also? And put, put that officer in different locations just to make the public aware that the police could be there and you will receive a summons if you're going through a red light. Yeah, that would have been a question for for captain, for the captain. Yeah. That's a whole other ball game. I think we should. That's a whole other. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, I'll have to get my pillows since I'll be here all night. Okay. 
So is there a feeling from the committee that we would write a letter of support for this? I had a question, Barbara had a question. I'm sorry, please go and ahead. I, I would like to say something as well. When, when uh, you both I, I have a real problem with this, I'm sorry. I have three children. I want all children to be safe, no question about that. But the ethical culture of fields and school charges $55,000 a year for a child to go there. And I don't understand why they just don't hire a private security guard. Um, you yourself said that um, there are very few security guards, or, I mean, crossing guards, excuse me, crossing mm -hmm. guards around. And the only ones that I know of are ones that work for public schools. If you know of some private schools, I'd love to hear the names of what they are, because I've mm -hmm. never heard of one that has a, has a, uh, you know, a, a city um, crossing guard for for a private school. Can you name any of them? Well, not offhand, but I will, as soon as I get the information, I'll bring that to the to the board. All right. Anyway, I mean, I I don't think I can support this because I think that they can absolutely afford to hire if they feel that children are in jeopardy, then they should be hiring um, a private crossing guard, and they should have done it years ago. It's shocking that they haven't. Ken? I have I'm, a uh, question. I'm with Barbara on this. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I know that Columbia Grammar, which is also on Central Park West, has a lot of issues uh, up at 93rd Street. And um, I've never seen a school uh, NYPD crossing guard there, but I have seen um, a lot. They, I know they've hired, they hire people. They have their security staff out there um, in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, there's no reason why uh, um, ethical culture can't do the same. Um, I like to chime in now. I, I'm with Barbara and Ken, but for a yet another reason, I live, <clears throat> live right there and there is total car chaos when children are being left, uh, brought to school and brought away from school. I have never seen a school with that many private cars bringing children. It seems like every child is brought by a private car. And I personally feel unsafe given the total chaos in that area. So I think a, a, a giant safety improvement could be achieved by consolidating, you know, by carpooling or, or having the children uh, come to school in something other than uh, a private vehicle for each child. I think that's the big problem at that intersection. And that's something I would like to see. Uh, crossing guard isn't going to uh, rectify that situation. That's something that's wholly within the school's ability to improve. And I would like to see the school to do something not only for the children, but for people like me, people in the community. And where exactly is the entrance to the school? It's on Central Park West, between 63 and 64. Okay. And, and the double parking for dropping it's, it's, off? It's total chaos. It's a totally unsafe situation. There's triple parking. Cars are maneuvering in all sorts of weird ways. The school has to do something to improve safety, not just for the children, but for everyone else. And I suggest you go back to the school and speak to them about that. And um, Nelson, just out of curiosity, yes. where, where does the majority of, your, uh, of the students come live? Do you know? How far they travel to be at that school? Um, I do know that most of them live in the area. I know that we have five buses that uh, bus the kids in uh, for pick, pick up and discharge. And where do those buses originate? All over from Manhattan. Some from some a few from the Bronx, but most are in Manhattan. Do you happen to know, since the school is relatively close to Columbus Circle, how many students use mass transit to get to school? You know what? I could find that out. And also, isn't um, isn't Ethical Culture their main campus is in, in uh, the Bronx, the Bronx. right? <clears throat> That's correct. That's Fieldston. The main Stone. campus is it's in the Bronx. Fieldston. Fieldston section, oh, yes. Upper upper it is, yes. but yeah. Just the upper school. Right. Understood. So, um, where are we right now? Do we do we need more okay. info? Are we, are, yeah, are we ready to? Hands up. Oh, there's hands up. Okay, let's see. We've got, Ken has spoken. Uh, Mark Diller. Yeah, I, I understand the point about, um, about 
a school of that wealth and the Columbia Grammar is a very good parallel. Uh, and, and we had uh, issues with them with um, double parked vehicles at pickup. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them were, were SUVs driven by off-duty cops. Um, so good luck giving them a ticket. Um, <laughs> but um, um, but uh, and, and offline someday, I'll tell you the anecdote about the time that we all went up there to try to see it. But, but a couple of points, and I completely understand the point about, about uh, you know, a wealthy school uh, being able to afford to have a security guard. But a security guard and a crossing guard are different animals. A, a crossing guard is a peace officer who is empowered to stop traffic and do certain things. A security guard is a guy who uh, may or may not have tr appropriate training in this area. Um, and ev even if this were a religious school, which I'm pretty sure it's not, it may have originated that way, but it's not anymore. Yeah. Um, um, uh, even religious schools are entitled to certain supports. Um, for example, the textbooks that are used in religious schools come from um, the same place that the, the that public school uh, books come from. Um, so sharing those resources is appropriate when it's appropriate to the educational mission of educating our children. And I would submit that keeping them safe is absolutely right down Main Street of that. But mostly what I wanted to highlight is that the difference between a peace officer and some guy with a blue blazer is worth, um, is, is worth focusing on. So I would, uh, again, I'm not on your committee, but I would support um, uh, this effort. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Seema? So I, I put in the chat, just in full disclosure, my daughter attends uh, ethical culture. And I just wanted to add one piece of information that I, I feel like is missing. The past two years, the traffic situation has gotten significantly worse and that's a COVID driven phenomenon. So what used to happen before COVID is parents, um, buses, transit would just drop all the kids off at roughly, you know, within a 10, 15 minute Time frame, everybody would stream into the school and, and you know, the day would begin. Now, in order to prevent all of that congestion and people going through one space at the same time, there are drop offs for different grades all across um, Central Park West, both on the east side and the west side and 63rd Street, north and south side and 64th Street, north and south side. Again, this is to sort of prevent crowding so that people, the classes can go in sort of one at a time and therefore it's less of a COVID risk. But what has that has led to is sort of absolute chaos in terms of people everywhere, cars, buses, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. And the thing is, I'm just not sure when this COVID situation is gonna change. And so I feel like there is something that needs to be done, whether that's signage, um, crossing guards, something needs to be done to sort of bring a little bit of logic to the chaos right now. Thanks. Um, Sarah, your hands up. Yeah, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the point that it's a private school and they you know, can afford to hire someone. Um, and I'm definitely sympathetic to Howard's point that you know, more of these parents should not drive their kids to school. But all of that said, um, I do feel like these are children's lives we're talking about. And um, if there is something we can do to increase their safety, I, I think I'm supportive. So I guess I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent, but I think I would lean towards um, doing anything we can possibly do as a community board to save children's lives. All right, thanks. So. Um... I think we're all in agreement that signage is very important and that the signals at 63rd and Central Park West need to be looked at. Is that a fair statement so far? Yes. Okay, so the issue now is whether we want to support a, um, a crossing guard or for uh, you know, um, a peace officer as, as Mark put it earlier. Um, should we, should, should, can we see a, show of hands um, committee first on who would support um, writing a letter um, in favor of, of, a, of a crossing guard. I, just I, the, Andrew, yeah, I would just say. suggest, I, I may change my vote based on this. I, I'm given what Seema said, it seems like it's a, in large part a COVID issue with kids running across Central Park West from a bus. Um, so maybe if we couch the letter in terms of, you know, while uh, emergency orders or COVID is in effect or whatever, um, you know, we would support a crossing guard. 
because I, I, I do second. appreciate we're talking about children's lives. I, I would second Ken's suggestion. There you go, Ken, time to buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> Uh, can we also, though, support the uh, the signage and the, uh, oh, the change to the signals? Sure. Yes. All right. So the letter would say that, and and during the during the during the pandemic, um, where people are traveling in a different fashion, we support the use of a crossing guard to keep children safe. Words to that effect. Um, anybody have any comments on that proposal? Um, I, I, I will just, just say, oh, sorry. To, I would just like to say that I think we also just need to make sure all neighborhoods are being treated equally on this. There are a lot oh. of unsafe neighborhoods for kids right now who are crossing. And um, I, I appreciate that this one is one that we're going to vote for. I will vote for what we're discussing tonight. But, uh, you know, I think we need to pay close attention. The two things that have happened in this um, in these committee discussions over the years has been collegiate and ethical culture. And there are a lot of other um, public and private schools um, in our neighborhood across the district that are being underserved. And we need to make sure we're thinking about them as well. And hopefully they would come to us and yeah. make us, hopefully. Yeah. They certainly know the community board exists. Agreed. Safety and first for everyone. Absolutely. And I will vote for it, but I am just making the informal request to to try to do something about the insane triple parking there. That is a hazard not only to your kids, but to to me and my neighbors. So that's the first step. But yes, I will support this letter. All right. Um, why don't we get a show of hands um, from committee members first on um, whether you support this letter and the contents we've just elucidated. So. Uh, please raise your hand. Let me do mine while we're at it. Uh, uh, raise hand. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, six on the committee. Okay, let me lower those. Uh, Howard, were you voting virtually? Yeah, I had my hand up. I can't okay, raise it. So that's seven. Um, now committee members, in opposition, please raise your hands. One, one. Okay, we'll lower that. Um, committee members abstaining? Okay, so that's seven to one. Now, uh, um, non-committee board members in favor of the letter. Three, um, let me lower those. Uh, Non-committee board members in opposition to the letter. None. All right, so that's three, zero, zero, zero. Um, all right, thank you all for that discussion. And Nelson, thank you for bringing this to our attention. And, and thank, I want to thank everyone from the bottom of my heart Nelson, do we have your contact information? Have you? Uh, yes. Um, um, the chair um, has all my information. Chair Brown? Um, yes. Yeah. Steve? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Howard, do you uh, want to ask about new business or? Um, well, you can have, the, is there new business? I, I have a question for Colleen, if she's still here. Yes, Barbara. Colleen, I have a question for Colleen. Is she still here with us? Colleen, are you on? Let me see. Don't see her. You, Sorry, know, you, you mentioned the Rotunda project and in Parks and Environment, we've been trying to find out anything about when this project is either going to come back to the community board or is going to start building. And we have written, I have written numerous times to numerous people and I get zero response from everybody. So I'm beginning to wonder if anything's ever gonna happen there. Do you have well, any- Well, something has to happen because Amtrak needs to do work and there's gonna be construction. So, uh, yeah, and if we ever wanna see Hudson Line uh, Metro North trains coming down that 
that too, we also need work to happen, but we've been told but, it's likely spring now, I'm guessing, uh, Barbara. I don't think they would start it in the bad weather season, but. What makes you think it might even be spring? I mean, nothing has happened. We've seen no presentations or anything. No, we sure haven't. No. If it's, you can it's, find it's, out, I'd really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, we'll definitely Her ask. Angle. <laughs> Let me know. Thank you. Sure. Um, hey, anyway. could, I, could I jump in on that for one quick second? Um, I'm not sure who we've been reaching out to. There was that that person, wasn't her name Joan, Jonine or something, who was the head of the Bridges Division of DOT, not one that we usually dealt with. Is that to whom we've been reaching out? Because she's the one that um, would be the, the person who would have the information. Whether she'd be willing to share it is not my experience, but... Um, but I'm guessing she, she would tell Colleen, because we've been reaching out to Colleen, and Colleen has kept us up to date. I, uh, I but maybe it's time to reach people. out directly to Jonine. I, I, I reached out that's to all the gave the original presentation. Okay, well, that's, that's and, them. Um, I don't remember if her name was one of them. The name does not ring a bell, but it was other people from DOT. It was a, it was an unusual name for me, so that's why it kind of stuck in my I'll, I'll ask the borough commissioner. Is not yet, so I'm guessing I'm somewhere in the ballpark. Mm, all right, thank you. I'll look into that. Um, just so people know, um, the January meeting is on the 14th of January. That's the second Tuesday, according to my calendar. Um, is there any word on whether it's going to be in person? Um, I think that's still being decided. We're working by... on it. We're working on that. If anyone has questions or issues, feel free to contact me because we're working on a task force to try to figure out how we're going to go back. Uh, in person. And the 14th, I just want to make sure that date uh, is that. It's the day oh, before January 11th. it expires. I'm sorry, the 11th. Mark is right. Yeah, it's the 11th. Yeah, it's the it 11th. It is the 11th. Of January. Yep. It's early. So it's it's Tuesday, the 11th of January. Right. And the full board would be the 4th, obviously. So, okay. Um, and not hearing anybody else, um, I'm happy to wish everybody. A wonderful holiday and happy Absolutely. New Year. Absolutely. And um, if we learn anything from Kathy Chambers of Green Market, I will absolutely share it with everybody. But I think we have a, uh, and you know, when Ken submits it, I'm sure we'll see that we have a great resolution supporting them. So thank everyone. Hey, thanks, everyone. Hold it, hold it. I'm, I'm doing the minutes. I'm not writing the resolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you, that's the. Co-chair's job, isn't it? Oh, okay. I, but I think we, I, we. I can give you the wording, but it's very short. But... That's fine. We'll make up the resos then. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a great holiday. See you in the new year. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. Bye. Bye.